Good morning, or depending on when you're watching this, especially good afternoon or good evening. It's good to be with all of you at the Australian Air Power Conference, albeit virtually. Lots of credit to the folks organizing the 2020 Air Power Conference who have creatively and rapidly figured out how to shift online and enable a robust conversation even in such strange times. Because as you know, lots of things have changed post coronavirus. We're all at home more than we ever expected to be. I've grown an occasional beard. And the normal business of government has, if not halted, shifted its pace and focus. But some things haven't changed, including, I'd argue, the security environment we find ourselves in. It can be hard to lose sight of that larger strategic picture when the news of how the coronavirus swamps all our inboxes and our intellectual and emotional bandwidth to boot. But the novel coronavirus pandemic has not curtailed geopolitics. In fact, it seems to be intensifying many pre-existing conditions. What I'd like to do today is talk about those pre-existing trends and then offer some concluding thoughts about what the coronavirus might be doing to them. Let me dive right in. In 2016, then Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper commented that I don't recall a time when we have been confronted with a more diverse array of threats. Trends in the strategic landscape constitute a veritable litany of doom. Hyperbole notwithstanding, this litany would include the reemergence of challenges to US and Western dominance, the return of pronounced great power rivalry across all three regions of Eurasia, the resurgence of authoritarianism and global ideological struggle, the empowerment of the agents of international strife and discord, and the response to this point. Now I run through all this because it is important to stress that the rules-based order is not facing a singular, all-consuming struggle as it was during the Cold War. Instead, it is facing a disorienting array of dangers, which are occurring on multiple fronts and often compound one another's effects. For the rest of today's lecture, I'd like to elaborate on each of these. First, the shifting global equilibrium. In 1994, America possessed 25% of global GDP, more than twice as much of the next largest national economy, which happened to be a close ally, Japan. It accounted for 40% of world defense outlays and was the dominant military power, not just globally, but in every key region of the world. America's treaty allies in Europe and in the Asia Pacific accounted for another 47% of global GDP and 35% of global military spending, giving the US coalition upwards of 70% of global economic power and military spending. This constitute one of the starkest imbalances of power in world history and it created immense obstacles for those who were tempted to challenge the American-led order. Now, Russia might not have liked NATO expansion or US intervention in Kosovo. China might have bridled at being ringed by US alliances and forced deployments in the Pacific. But US dominance was so pronounced that neither country could do much about it. Since the early 2000s, however, that dominance has diminished. This is not to say that the geopolitical foundation of the post-war order has collapsed or that the world will be authentically bipolar, let alone multipolar anytime soon. What has happened though, is that power has diffused from its profoundly abnormally concentrated state of the 1990s so that the degree of US and Western dominance has diminished. Russia gradually recovered from its post-Cold War poverty, driven by high energy prices and once again filled the Kremlin's coffers and contributed to more than a twofold increase in constant dollar GDP between 1998 and 2014. China continued to experience an economic rise unlike anything in modern history, with its constant dollar GDP rising from 1.9 trillion to 8.3 trillion over the same period. As this was happening, the 2008 financial crisis cast many European countries into stagnation or even recession, while also denting American economic supremacy. And while economically rising or resurgent powers pour money into defenses, many of America's closest allies slash military allies amid economic traumas. Potential rivals were simultaneously gaining ground. Russia remained a second-rate economic power, but a double defense spending over the course of a decade and developed capabilities needed to better compete with the West. Chinese power grew exponentially, rising from 3.3 to 11.8% of global GDP and from 2.2 to 12.2% of world military spending between 1994 and 2015. As in Russia's case, China's military buildup featured the tools needed to offset US advantages and project Chinese power abroad. The essentially uncontested US and Western primacy of the late 1990s 
was becoming the much more contested primacy of the early 21st, 21st century. The psychological balance of power was shifting even more markedly. Iraq and Afghanistan created a widespread sense that the United States was neither as mighty nor as competent as before. The 2008 financial crisis also had outside psychological effect by dimming the luster of the liberal economic model and convincing some observers that America would henceforth lack the resources or the will to lead. The reality, and even more so the perception of US and Western dominance was slipping. And as in previous eras, a shifting global balance was now empowering actors who sought to, to disrupt the existing order. Now, great power rivalry has not returned in the sense that great power war has returned, but the era of great power peace is over. Relations between the world's strongest states are increasingly defined by undisguised rivalry and even conflict. There's ever sharper jostling for power and ever greater contestation of global norms and principles. From East Asia to the Middle East to Eastern Europe, authoritarian actors carve out and have worked to push their own privileged spheres of regional dominance. China is leading the way. Although Beijing has been a leading beneficiary of a liberal economic order that has allowed it to amass great prosperity, Chinese leaders nonetheless always regarded American primacy as something to be endured for a time rather than suffered forever. America's preeminent position in the Asia Pacific, or what we now call the Indo-Pacific region, represents an affront to the pride and sense of historical destiny of a country that still considers itself the Middle Kingdom. Yang Jiechi, China's foreign minister, made the point in 2010, lecturing the nations of Southeast Asia that, quote, China is a big country and other countries are small countries, and that's just a fact. By blending intimidation with inducement, China has been able to work to create a Sinocentric regional order, a new Chinese tribute system for the 21st century. Beijing has harassed, harassed ships and planes operating in international waters and airspace. Beijing has also divided international bodies such as ASEAN. All the while, China has been steadily building formidable military tools designed to keep the United States out of the region and thereby give Beijing a free hand. Military and paramilitary forces have harassed, confronted, and violated the sovereignty of countries from Vietnam to the Philippines to India. China has consistently exerted pressure on Japan in the East China Sea. Economically, Beijing uses its muscle to reward those who comply with China's policies and punish those who don't, and to advance geoeconomic projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative. All of these are designed to bring the region closer into its orbit. Strikingly, China has also abandoned its long professed principle of non-interference in other countries' domestic politics. By exerting the reach of Chinese propaganda and using investments and even bribery to co-opt regional elites, payoff to Australian politicians are as critical to China's regional project as development of carrier killer missiles. Now, if China represents the greatest long-term threat and challenges to the rules-based order, the resurgence of great power competition is even more acute in Europe. For many Russians, the post-Cold War era was not a time of triumph and tranquility. It was a time of weakness and humiliation, a period when Russia lost its great power status and was impotent to resist the encroachments of US and Western influence. As Russia has regained a degree of strength then, it has resigned, regained a degree of strength and sought to reassert primacy along its periphery and restore lost influence further abroad, often through measures less subtle and more overtly aggressive than China's. Moscow has twice humiliated and dismembered former Soviet republics that committed the sin of tilting towards the West or throwing out pro-Russian leaders, first in Georgia and then in Ukraine. Russia has also worked to weaken the institutions that maintain European security. It has sought to undermine NATO and the EU via cyber attacks, military intimidation and paramilitary subversion, financial support for anti-EU and anti-NATO politicians, and dissemination of fake news and other forms of intervention in European and US political processes. In 2016, Russian intelligence operatives reportedly tried to overthrow the government of Montenegro to prevent it from joining NATO. If I wanted, Putin reportedly bragged in 2014, in two days, I could have Russian troops not only in Kiev, but also in Riga, Vilnius, Tallinn, Warsaw, and Bucharest. That same year, Secretary of State John Kerry was describing Russian behavior as something out of the 19th century. 
What he captured was that Russia was simply behaving like Russia again. It was asserting its great power prerogatives in ways that only seemed anomalous to those with very short historical memories. Finally, geopolitical revisionism is alive and well in the Middle East. Iran, the primary state author of that revisionism, is not in the same political power league as Russia or China, but it is a proud civilization that never accepted a Middle Eastern order led by Washington, as well as a revolutionary state that has long sought to export its ideology and influence. Amid the vacuum of regional power that was created first by the US invasion of Iraq and then by the Arab Spring, Iran has thus been making a bid for its primacy. Our borders have spread, announced Qassam Soleimani, the former leader of Iran's Al-Quds force in 2011. Iran has sought those victories by intervening either directly or indirectly through proxy forces in conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, by promoting a sectarian agenda that seeks to polarize the region, and by investing in its nuclear program and capabilities such as ballistic missiles and special operations forces. The revisionism we are seeing today may be only the beginning. As China's power continues to grow, or if it successfully dominates the Western Pacific, it will surely move on to grander endeavors. If Russia reconsolidates control over the former Soviet space, it may seek to bring parts of the former Western Warsaw Pact to a heel. Historically, this has been a recurring pattern of great power behavior. Interests expand with power. The appetite grows with the eating. Risk-taking increases as early gambles are seen to pay off. And this pattern is precisely why the revival of great power competition is so concerning, because geopolitical revisionism by unsatisfied major powers has so often presaged intensifying international conflict, confrontation, and even war. The deepening competition over power and norms relate to another resurgent form of conflict, the return of global ideological struggle. After the Cold War, many observers believed that an inexorably expanding zone of free and open societies would lead to ever deeper international peace. Today, however, the world is experiencing a global crisis of democracy, and ideological divisions are once more driving strategic rivalry. To begin with, the spread of democracy has stalled and began to recede. Between 1974 and 2000, the number of electoral democracies tripled from 39 to 120. By 2006, however, that momentum had turned. The number of electoral democracies remained roughly stagnant in the 12 years that followed as the number of democratic breakdowns and the frequency of democratic backsliding increased. Authoritarian models, conversely, are on the offensive. Around the world, strong men have made a comeback. Illiberal populism has surged, and the one-party state has been flexing its muscle. Dictatorships proved that they could learn and adapt. As illiberal leaders saw what happened to their authoritarian brethren, they became smarter, more skillful, and more tenacious. In countries from Iran to China, autocrats mobilized the power of technology to monitor populations, enforce political loyalty, and repress dissent. Moreover, the political difficulties that democracies encountered in producing robust and equitable economic growth, and in providing a sense of cohesion and community amid rapid disorienting change, created an opening for authoritarian leaders to pursue undemocratic models at home and to tout those models to the rest of the world. Ideology here intersects with geopolitics because the world's most powerful dictatorships are taking active steps to strengthen authoritarianism and weaken democracy abroad. They have opposed the spread or survival of liberal political values in their own regions, witnessed China's progressive erosion of democratic norms in Macau and Hong Kong, and Russia's efforts to subvert democratic governments in Georgia, Ukraine, and Montenegro. But nowhere are these efforts more audacious than Russian and Chinese efforts to undermine the political systems of their adversaries. The Kremlin's bid to influence the US election in 2016 was a sophisticated assault featuring cyber espionage and the weaponization of inflammatory information. Likewise, China has suborned democratic decision-making in countries by spreading fake news, bribing or co-opting democratic actors, compromising the intellectual freedom of foreign academic institutions and underwriting nominally independent, but in reality subservient mouthpieces in democratic societies. The goal of this activity is to weaken geopolitical rivals by distorting their democratic processes and exacerbating their internal divisions. This is not the same thing as soft power. It is something darker and sharper, where authoritarian regimes rely on subversion, bullying, and pressure not just to compel behavior at home, 
but to manipulate it at broad. This does not mean that the world has returned to the intense Manichaean clashes of the Cold War. Today's authoritarians are less universal universalistic in their ideologies, and for the most part, less totalitarian in their governance than their Soviet predecessors. Yet the world is nevertheless experiencing a resurgence of governing models that rely on coercion and political violence. And some of those regimes are again working to strengthen their rule and expand their influence by undermining, undermining liberal governance overseas. These trends in turns remind us that the political foundations of the rules-based order are being tested more severely than at any time in decades, and that ideological struggles once again fueling geopolitical strife. Meanwhile, the system is being buffeted by yet another dangerous phenomenon, a general intensification of global disorder. Due to factors ranging from rapid technological change to disruptions caused by globalization, the agents of disorder have become more empowered than at any time in recent decades. That empowerment is evident in diverse phenomena that might otherwise seem unconnected. Take the emergence of super spoilers, actors that cannot remake the international order, but are violently opposed to that order and can disrupt it in fundamental ways. One can see this with North Korea's pursuit of a robust nuclear arsenal, in the rise of ISIS, in the violent instability from in the Middle East, from the turmoil that has spread to Europe with refugee flows and terrorist attacks upsetting the stability of that continent. The final manifestation of intensified global disorder is the proliferation of issues that are increasingly difficult to address through existing international fora. Over the past decade, global governance has worked fairly well on some issues, responding to the financial crisis of 2008 or suppressing piracy off the Horn of Africa. But on other emerging issues, threats posed by cyber espionage and cyber warfare most prominently, the complexity of the problem seems to be outpacing existing in institutions' capacities. Here as elsewhere, the strain on the international system is heightened by the fact that various sources of international upheaval often exacerbate one another. What ties these issues together is that they all contribute to an international environment in which instability is proliferated and escalated. And as the attacks on the system intensify, the defenses seem to be weakening. Today, the pressure on the international order is increasing. What about the defenders of the rule-based order? European allies have long represented America's most crucial global partners, but Europe is suffering from profound and pervasive malaise. The fate of the EU is uncertain as Britain stumbles toward Brexit and anti-immigration sentiment roils countries from the Black Sea to the Atlantic. Illiberal and xenophobic movements have surged and democratic practices are too frequently being eroded. Beneath a superficial unity, North, South, and East, West divisions have deepened and growing splits have emerged between those who want to take a stronger line against Russia and China and those who are eager to pursue closer relations with Moscow and Beijing. Europe still represents a concentration of great power, economic and potentially militarily in world affairs. Yet as the international environment turns ominous, Europe's ability to act with unity and purpose has seemed ever more questionable. In the Asia Pacific, the picture is somewhat brighter as the region's economic dynamism has offset some of the challenge Europe has faced. But here too, the picture is less of unified resolve than of hedging, uncertainty, and division. Among US allies and partners, defense budgets have risen, but they have not kept pace with rapid Chinese advances. The collective diplomatic response to Beijing's pressures in the South China Sea has too often been lackluster, with China able to prevent unified action by picking off one or two of the region's poorer or more authoritarian members. Multilateral cooperation against growing security threats is gradually increasing, but old rivalries between Japan and South Korea, for instance, often stand in the way. The open regional order has many advocates, but their ability and willingness to uphold that order remains unclear. And what about America? There has been a growing global perception that America's commitment and resolve are simply not what they used to be. Obama's caution and retrenchment may or may not have been warranted after the overextension of the Bush years, but they certainly fed a sense among many US allies and partners that America was in retreat. And under an erratic and clearly skeptical Donald Trump, concerns about US credibility have exponentially intensified. By questioning security commitments and bullying allies, by withdrawing from or threatening to tear up trade deals and other multilateral agreements, by crazing authoritarians while slamming devoted Democrats 
Trump has stirred confusion and doubt among countries that have long depended on American leadership. Large majorities of international observers find Trump untrustworthy and even dangerous, while foreign leaders wonder how reliable Trump's America really is. Concerns about American reliability are not new, of course, and too much US activism can be just as discomforting as too little. But the fact remains that there is now surging global uncertainty about the future of US foreign policy, and that uncertainty is in itself a destabilizing factor in international relations. So what is the coronavirus doing to each of these trends? Obviously, it's too soon to answer that question definitively at this early stage, but there's some observations worth making and some questions that are worth asking. Earlier, I just walked through five different forces shaping today's international environment. Shifting military balances, the return of pronounced great power, rivalry, the resurgence of authoritarianism and global ideological struggle, the empowerment of agents of disorder, and the response to this point. I'd like to narrow the scope here a bit to what it's doing to each of these forces within Asia. First, how about the military balance? I note that this is both a long-term challenge and a short-term problem. That is, military balances and budgets need to be evaluated not as a snapshot, but where they are going over the long haul. This is true for how we evaluate any one nation's capabilities or how we might aggregate the combined capabilities of an alliance. The latter point is critical, however, because we do ourselves an intellectual as well as a strategic disservice by only looking at the balance of power in Asia as between two players, the United States and China. After all, the United States has multiple allies in Asia, each of whom possesses their own capabilities and has independent agencies over their sovereign choices. So looking at the balance of power means looking at how countries emerge from COVID on their own, in concert with others, and relative to other powers. The critical question here, I think, is how much downward pressure on defense budgets COVID exerts, which will be answered largely uh, by, how severe, by how severe it is and how long it lasts for. Different countries will have different answers to those questions. The other question is which nation's economies recover faster and what, in a post-COVID world, the mandate is for spending on traditional defense. I also said that this was a short-term problem because the coronavirus has not paused geopolitical competition. In Asia, it seems to have accelerated it. Since the outbreak of the coronavirus, Beijing seems to sense an opportunity even as it holds itself out as a model of cooperation with its neighbors. Beijing recently announced new administrative districts in the South China Sea. It's trailed Malaysian and Philippine vessels. It's conducted dangerous maneuvers seemingly intended to intimidate Japan, Vietnam, and Taiwan. With its rivals hobbled and its neighbors overwhelmed, Beijing appears to see the pandemic as an opportunity to press its advantage and more forcibly assert its authority. With the United States faltering its domestic response and failing to lead a unified international response and Southeast Asia besieged by COVID-19, there is certainly room for Beijing to press its advantage and seek opportunities to assert its own interests. Further, Growing concern that the U.S. military may face readiness issues with multiple naval assets are likely to affirm Beijing's perceptions that the situation is conducive to more opportunism. While the pandemic may be the cause of these recent actions, it is important to underscore that this is not a new approach to regional affairs. Rather, it is a reflection of the opportunism and assertiveness that have long been a hallmark of China's pre-pandemic approach. Looking ahead, Australia, the United States, and the rest of the Indo-Pacific should expect continued opportunism from China. This is also true in the ideological realm. China's information approach appears to have shifted significantly during the pandemic. Long focused on spreading narratives favorable to the Chinese Communist Party and suppressing those that are unfavorable, China's strategy has become much more assertive and global. Some Chinese officials are now using Russian-style disinformation campaigns that seek to create confusion and make the truth unknowable, as with the outlandish claim that the novel coronavirus was planted by the US military. It's not going to be a stretch to argue that international institutions have struggled to keep up in this environment, or even muster much by way of a coordinated response to date. Strategic competition should not preclude necessary cooperation to combat the coronavirus. Although they will continue to see themselves as competitors, the United States and China share incentives to facilitate a global economic recovery because neither their economies can return to full strength while the world remains hobbled. 
And while the United States and China perceive themselves to be competing in their search for the COVID-19 vaccine, neither country will be safe as long as outbreaks continue anywhere. So both share an interest in a global vaccine. But neither should this cooperation obscure the reality that competition will endure. The contest for economic advantage, military dominance, technological prowess, and ideology will be part of geopolitics, and certainly of the Indo-Pacific region, for years to come. Coronavirus has only made this more clear.